Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be calculating the stiffness matrix for that three node bar element that we derived earlier. And in order to do that, we're going to be using Galerkin's formulation. So in order to start off, we need to look at the type of element that we're going to be analyzing, which is a bar. And we want to see what forces are being applied here. So we know that we want some forces on each of the nodes. But then let's also apply a shear force along the perimeter of the element. So the way we're going to formulate this is it is uh, some shear stress, which can vary as a function of x, multiplied by the perimeter. And then in order to get a differential equation, we need to look at some differential element of our bar, which we'll zoom into down here. And we'll say that the length of this element is delta x. So the force coming from the left-hand side is just going to be a force based off of a position x. And the force on the right-hand side will be the force of that x plus delta x. And then our shear force looks very similar. That's just going to be the perimeter again multiplied by that shear stress. Now, what we're saying from this differential element is that the sum of the forces is equal to zero. And so the three forces that we have applied are the force of x, the force of x plus delta x, and then this shear stress. And so this is going to be the perimeter multiplied by the shear force multiplied by delta x, and all of that together is equal to zero. Now, in order to turn this into a differential equation, we divide the entire equation through by delta x, and then we can cancel out the delta x's here, while this first term just becomes a derivative of f with respect to x. So this becomes that df dx plus the perimeter times the shear stress is equal to zero. Now, diving into what this force actually means, really our force here is the compressive or tensile stress multiplied by the cross-sectional area. And so we can rewrite this as A times E, the Young's modulus, multiplied by the strain, epsilon or AE times DU DX. We can plug this in to get the final form of our equation. And so this becomes a D by DX of AE DU DX, which will be equal to a negative perimeter multiplied by the shear stress at that point X. So far, we haven't actually done anything special. We've just derived the differential equation for a bar. Galerkin's formulation says that we can take this differential equation, integrate it over the length of the bar, and multiply that differential equation by a weighting function. And if we do all this, then this equation will still hold true. The weighting functions that we're choosing here are our psi of i's, our shape functions. So remember for our shape functions that each one of these is 1 for the node that it applies to and 0 for the other two nodes. And they're parabolas, and so the shape of psi 1, for instance, is going to be a parabola that hits 0 at x equals L over 2 and X equals L and 1 at X equals 0. Psi 3 is nice and symmetric because it hits X equals L at 1 and 0 at the other two locations. And then Psi 2 is a little bit different, but it's still a parabola. And what we could say here was that the displacement at a point X was equal to the displacement at node 1 multiplied by the shape function at node 1 plus the displacement at node 2 times the shape function at node 2 and finally the displacement at node 3 times the shape function at node 3. 
And so these are the shape functions that we are multiplying by before we integrate in Galerkin's formulation. The next step here is integration by parts. And I'm going to skip the ugly calculus and just go straight to the answer. And what we end up with is this a e d u d x chunk multiplied by our shape function. That entire piece evaluated from x equals 0 to x equals l. And then we subtract off the integral from 0 to l of a e d u d x multiplied by d psi i dx. And that is all integrated with respect to x. And that's going to be equal to the integral on the right hand side, which we don't have to change. Now with this in place, just a reminder that this chunk here is exactly our force. So for our next step here, we're going to simplify this chunk by just calling it f times psi of i evaluated at those two endpoints. And then we're going to pull this integral of our shear force over to the left hand side so that we have all of our forces together. And so that just leaves us with this chunk. And so what we end up with here is that AE being pulled out, we're going to assume that it's constant. You don't technically have to, but it makes life a lot harder if you don't. And so we're going to leave these as constant for each element. We're going to integrate from 0 to L. And then we're going to evaluate this du dx based off of our shape functions up here. So the way we write that is du dx is equal to u1 times d by dx of psi1 plus u2 times d by dx of psi2 plus u3 times d by dx of psi3. And the reason we only need to differentiate our psi terms is because u1, u2, u3 are constants with respect to space. They're variables in terms of our overall equation, but when we're looking at the individual displacements, there's no variation with space there. We're only at that point. Whereas all of the variation with space comes from our shape functions. Now this is FEA, so the way we want to write this is going to be as the product of two vectors. So let's have our psi terms in a row vector, and then our u1, u2, u3 will just be a column vector multiplying that. And so this chunk here is what we're going to be integrating in our equation down here. And that'll be multiplied by d psi i dx. So this is our du dx chunk, and then we're going to have another d psi i dx. So let's go ahead and write that out. Now, we haven't specified which i we're multiplying by. But we have three of them. And so what we can do is we can actually write three separate equations for i equals 1, 2, and 3 and end up with a 3 by 3 matrix for our stiffness matrix here, which is going to be multiplied by our displacements and equal to a vector of forces. So let's start off by writing our vector of forces. So when i is equal to 1, all that changes here is that we plug in psi 1 for our vector. And I missed changing this to a positive whenever I moved it over earlier, but that should be positive here. And this is going to be equal to the AE term, which we brought out of the integral, multiplied by a massive integral for a 3 by 3 matrix. And we can bring this 
U1, U2, U3 outside of that integral as well, because again, there's no variation there with respect to space. So we don't need to integrate anything there. Each of these terms is going to be a pair of shape function derivatives. So the first term here is going to be the d psi 1 dx from this piece. And then we're looking at i equals 1. And so that will be d psi 1 dx, d psi 1 dx. The next chunk will have the d psi 2 dx here. And then again, a d psi 1 dx from this term. And then finally, this last term will have a psi 3 for the first piece and keep the psi 1 for the second piece. Now, the, st the structure stays the same for the rest of the matrix. So all we need to do is just write out which size we're taking derivatives of. Now, for each of the first terms, we're just going to follow this pattern from our original vector here. So this will be psi 1, psi 1, then psi 2, psi 2, and psi 3, psi 3. As we go down, each row is going to have a different psi i dx. This first row was all multiplied by d psi 1 dx. The second row will all be d psi 2 dx. And the third row is d psi 3 dx. Once we perform this integral, we will have our stiffness matrix. Now, there's a good chunk of math involved here. So I'm going to do this for d psi 1, d psi 2, just so you can see it. But then I'm going to skip to the final answer. The integral that we're trying to perform is the integral from 0 to L of d by dx of psi 1 multiplied by d by dx of psi 2. And just as a reminder from a previous video, psi 1 here is equal to 2 times x squared over l squared minus 3x over l plus 1. Psi 2 is negative 4x squared over l squared plus 4x over l. And in case you want to double check my work or try it on your own, Psi 3 is 2x squared over L squared minus x over L. And so taking the derivative of Psi 1 with respect to x, we get 4x over L squared minus 3 over L, and then this 1 goes away. And that'll be multiplied by the derivative of Psi 2, which is going to be a negative 8x over L squared plus a 4 over L. So now we FOIL out these two polynomials and we get a negative 32x squared over L to the fourth plus 16x over L cubed plus 24x over L cubed. And then finally, minus 12 over L squared. This will get us a negative 32 over 3L. This will get us a 8 over L. This will be 12 over L. And this last piece will just stay 12 over L. And if you add all that up, you end up with negative 8 over 3 and so after integration, this is the end result of this element right here. And so to finish up, we can go ahead and bring out this L and end up with AE over L, which is the same thing that came before our bar elements just for the two node. And that's going to be multiplied by so we got this negative 8 thirds already. The other pieces are 7 thirds, negative 8 thirds, 1 third, and this is 16 thirds, and negative 8 thirds again, 
and then one third again, negative eight and seven. And that's all multiplied by u1, u2, and u3. Now we still want to account for the forces here, and we can actually simplify these forces out a little bit more. The psi one evaluated at x equals zero is equal to one. And so from that multiplied by f, all we get is exactly the force at x equals one. Well, we already have a name for that. That's f one x. This piece stays the same. So this is just the perimeter multiplied by the integral of tau multiplied by psi one dx. Looking at our psi two equation, there's no force applied at x equals L over two. And so there's no force that we include here, but we do include this P times the integral of tau psi two dx. And then for psi three, we end up with f two x, and again, add that uh, tau term. So this chunk down here is our final set of equations. And this matrix is our stiffness matrix in the local reference frame. So if we wanted to use this for a truss, we'd have to do some work rotating that, but it is definitely doable. But in any case, uh, this is how the Galerkin's formulation works. Uh, using this, we can write the stiffness matrix for any set of shape functions. So even if we wanted to go to a four node or a 10 node bar for some reason, we could still use Galerkin's formulation in order to come up with a stiffness matrix. As always, I hope this was informative and I will catch you next time.